Good evening, everybody, and thank you for watching. Those at home and for those who are present here tonight, thank you for coming. Today, I want to share with you an important subject that will affect or that affects all of us. As we look around us at world events, we see the international conflicts, the economic turmoil, natural disasters, religious extremism. What does it all mean? Where's it all headed? These things have left many uh, asking questions. Are these, what's the cause of all these things? Are they just natural, random events, in particular with the political and economic world? Or is there some power at play that's uh, uh, orchestrating these things for, for uh, certain ends? Well, what I want to share with you tonight is, that, is the fact that these are not just random events. These are things that have been... Um, carried on for decades. There is a powers at play who are organising uh, their uh, forces to bring about what is called in their circles a new world order. Now this new world order has been spoken of for centuries, last two or three hundred years, but we are closer now today than we've ever been in the past. And so close are we that these powers are not uh, any longer um, uh, willing to remain silent on the fact of what they're doing. They're quite bold about it. To give you an idea, in, in fact, uh, 20 years ago, there was a book published. And uh, some of you might remember the book. It was called The Keys of This Blood. Some of you might have read that or seen it. The Keys of This Blood by Malachi Martin. Now, Malachi Martin was an ex-former uh, professor of the uh, Vatican Biblical Institute, Pontifical Biblical Institute of the Vatican. He was an expert on Vatican affairs and he uh, was uh, often called upon in radio and television to give his views on matters concerning the Vatican. And in particular, when he published this book in 1990, uh, he, he was speaking engagements everywhere to talk about uh, the things he wrote of in this book. And what was this book about? Well, the title, the subtitle of the book was uh, The Struggle for World Dominion Between Pope John Paul II, Mikhail Gorbachev and the Capitalist West. Of course, uh, this is 20 years ago when he wrote this book. But let's, just to give you an idea of uh, what, what uh, uh, these uh, powers are all about, Martin introduces uh, the scene in no uncertain terms for us. He spells it out loud and clear. He says, and I want to read this from his uh, a preface to his book, willing or not, ready or not, we are all involved in an all-out, no-holds-barred, three-way global competition. Most of us are not competitors. We are the stakes. For the competition is about who will establish, now note this, who will establish the First, one world system of government that has ever existed in the society of nations. It is, did you note that? It's a one world system of government, the first ever existed that takes in the whole of this globe, every nation on this earth. He goes on to say that it is about who will hold and wield the dual power of authority and control over each of us as individuals and over all of us together as a community, over the entire six billion people, and note this was written 20 years ago, today that's uh, seven billion, expected by demographers to inhabit the globe by early in the third millennium. So he sets it quite plainly there for us. It is a global competition about who is going to control this one world system of government. He says, he goes on to say that the competition is all out because now that it has started, there is no way that it can be reversed or called off. No holds are barred. Now note this, this is why no holds are barred. Because once the competition has been decided, the world and all that's in it, our way of life as individuals and as citizens of the nations, our families and our jobs, 
our trade and commerce and money, our educational systems and our religions and our cultures, our, even our badges of national identity, which most of us have always taken for granted, all will have been powerfully and radically altered forever. Not one sector of our lives will remain untouched. No one will be exempt from its effects. So that's what it's about. The competitors he outlines in his book, three competitors in this global battle. Number one is the global capitalists. Number two are the global socialists. And the third power he identified as being the Pope, as the head of the Roman Catholic hierarchy. These are the three major powers at play in this global competition to bring about this new world order. One of these will be left in control. That's their aim. For one of these to be left in control uh, is uh, what this struggle is about. Who is going to be that player that's, that will end up controlling this one world system of government? Well, to, sh to uh, share another th uh, uh, statement from the press, you can find this in the archives. We'll find this in the Los Angeles Times, February 18, 1991. This was a press report of a, uh, of a United States um, address that George Bush Sr. gave on the eve of the liberation of Kuwait. Now, for those uh, of you at home who may not uh, recall, and those listening here tonight, um, in 1991, uh, Kuwait had been overtaken by Iraq, and America had gone into, uh, with the Allied forces, had gone in to liberate Kuwait. And in announcing that liberation of Kuwait from the Iraqis, note this one paragraph from George Bush Sr. Notice this. It's a big idea, a new world order where diverse nations are drawn together in a common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind, peace and security, freedom and the rule of law. You see, the United States had gone together with a number of the allied nations from Europe and uh, other places together, uh, and Australia as well, together to liberate Kuwait. And he said here, only the United States has the moral standing and the means to back it up. So the United States representing the global capitalists, the power or the international power with the means to back up what they're calling this new world order, a universal uh, um, or a common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind. Now, it sounds good, peace and security, freedom and the rule of law. But whose law? The rule of whose law? That's what I want to ask you. I mean, who makes those laws and in what areas of our lives will they control? And uh, it's an interesting question. And uh, to um, highlight now what the uh, second power at play is about, the global socialists, I want to share with you um, some information on an organisation that not many of us have ever heard of, the World Constitution and Parliament Association. Now, these, this association has been around for a number of decades, and its objectives... Uh, which were um, published uh, in a book called En Route to Global Occupation by Gary Carr in 1992. Now, in that book, Gary outlines uh, the objectives of this association. And it's stated here, to establish a, note this, a new world order of disarmed nation-states submitting to the legislative and authority of the World Parliament with its World Executive Cabinet, its World Civil Service, its World Financial Administration, its World Judiciary, its World Police, a World Ombudsman, and of course, a World Bill of Rights. Now, all this and more is detailed in the Constitution for the Federation of Earth. 
which uh, this organisation has put together, and it's been ratified a number of, uh, by a number of um, uh, powers that be. Many people would never have heard of this association. As I said, it's been around for decades, but there are many political leaders and in uh, legal circles and political circles who are involved in the affairs of this association in the world today. So that's the global capitalist agenda. Now remember, to control is their goal. Their moves toward this new world order, in moving towards it, they are calling, now note this, they're calling for a new world economic order. Now does that phrase sound familiar to you? A new world economic order? Considering the events of Europe today and what's happening there in the European Union with the uh, financial meltdown of a number of nation states there, and uh, how, and particularly in the global financial crisis of 2008, 2008, uh, 08, 09, calls were being voiced by many in the political circles for a new world economic order. And uh, this is just echoing the objectives of these uh, powers that be. Again, their objective is for a one European currency. They want all nations to be on parity with the US dollar. So by bringing all of Europe under one currency, they can take care of all, the other, all those currencies of Europe under this one euro. And then they want to bring that euro on parity with the US dollar. Okay? And they're doing that in other countries as well. I mean, look at Australian dollar today. I mean, who remembers? Who remembers what the Australian dollar was worth you know, 10 years ago? You know, anywhere from 65 to 75 cents. Today, it's virtually on parity with the US dollar. We would never have dreamed of that, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Who would have thought of that? But this is what they're trying, this is what they're wanting to do. It's all part of their agenda. They also want to bring about a new world political order and a united European parliament. But we're seeing, so despite the fact that they're wanting to bring about all these things, you know, the... the, the uh, um, the words that we are hearing today in the press regarding Europe, that it's uh, threatening that a num number of nations are on the verge of perhaps pulling out of the European Union. Uh, maybe they will, maybe they won't. But despite that, this is their goal, to have a united European Parliament and, and a one euro th currency throughout all of Europe. So this is what they're wanting to do, to bring about, and this is all essential for them to do this so they can bring about this new world order. Their vision is immense. It's a dream that men have had for centuries. To have one world, a one world system of government to control all the inhabitants of this earth. Now, no matter who of the contenders wins, to control is their goal. You better believe that. Not one of us here tonight and for you listening at home, not one of you will be left unaffected. And we are feeling the effects of, that, of their efforts to bring this about today. My question tonight is, will they succeed? Will they achieve their goal of one world government? It's a great dream, a great vision. To answer... I want tonight to look at God's Word, the Bible. For I believe it has a lot to say on just what is taking place today. In particular on this subject, will a universal one world system of government ever be achieved? This is a great dream that many men have had. They've set out in conquests, thousands of uh, uh, soldiers have, have uh, given their lives for causes, uh, uh, for lesser things, but many have given their lives in this cause, to control other nations, to control not just one or two nations, but to control the entire world. That's been a dream of many in, the, in these um, past ages. One of those, I'm going to go back 2,000 years ago, one of those men was named Nebuchadnezzar. He was the king of Babylon. 
And he's spoken of in the Bible in Daniel chapter 2. You see, Nebuchadnezzar was the king of what history records as the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Tonight, I want to look at Daniel chapter 2. For Daniel 2 contains a dream that was given to this king, Nebuchadnezzar. And it was a dream that helped answer the question of, will there be a one-world system of government? Will there be one world system of government? So let's have a look at this tonight. Do you know this dream, and why I'm, why I'm relating you to this dream, because this dream was shown to many in the past who have tried to achieve a one world system of government. Many have been shown these prophecies of the Bible, many who have tried to bring about this new world order have been shown this particular chapter in the Bible, in particular and how it relates to Europe today. And, uh, but despite what, this, by what the Word of God says they've uh, still continued on in their course and failed. Why is that? Well, let's have a look. To set you in the scene, um, as I said, Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. Now, in his second year of his reign, he dreamed a dream. I'm going to read from Daniel chapter 2. If you'd like to open your Bibles there, Daniel chapter 2 and verses 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, he dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled. And uh, why was it troubled? Well, he had dreamed a dream about something that he knew was very significant. But when he woke from that dream, he couldn't remember what it was. But he knew it was important. And so what he did, he commanded all his magicians and astrologers and sorcerers, his Chal the Chaldeans, for to show the king his dreams. So they came and they stood before the king. And the king said to them, look, I've dreamed a dream and I've dreamed a dream and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. And, the Chaldean, and he asked the Chaldeans to tell him what his dream was. But more important than that, not only to tell him what the dream was, but to tell him the interpretation of the dream. Well, how would you feel with that kind of a question? If uh, I said that to you, tell me my dream and its interpretation. Well, the Chaldeans didn't, didn't know what to say. And all they could say to him was, King, there's not a man upon this earth that can show you the matter. It's a rare thing that you're requiring. There is none other that can show up before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Daniel chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. So these uh, wise men and astrologers, they recognize the fact that, well, look, with it, that they don't really know everything. In fact, on this particular point, what that king was thinking, they had no clue about what he was dreaming, I should say. What he was dreaming, they had no clue about. How could they give an interpretation without the dream? And there's no one on this earth who can do that except, you know, the gods in heaven. Only they can do that. And the king, when he heard this, he got so furious with them that he ordered for them all to be destroyed. Every wise person of Babylon. And uh, caught up in that command was a Jewish captive by the name of Daniel. Of course, the author of the book of Daniel in the Bible. Now, Daniel, when he heard what the king had said, uh, well, he heard this uh, command from the king, he said to the king's guard, look, or actually he went into the king and said, look, king, Give me some time and I'll ask my God to tell me what the dream is and uh, I'll let you know what it is and the interpretation of it. Well, Daniel must have been uh, liked pretty much by the king because the king gave him some time. So Daniel went and he prayed together and he prayed together with his three, his three uh, colleagues that he had there with him in Babylon that were taken captive with him. And God gave to Daniel, in answer to his prayer, God gave to Daniel the same dream. And not only that, he gave him also the interpretation of the dream. And so Daniel then, when he, when he received this uh, dream and its interpretation, he blessed uh, the God of heaven. He said, Blessed be the name of God forever, for, his, for wisdom and might are his. And in Daniel's response, uh, I think is a key to understanding what this dream was all about. Notice this in Daniel chapter 2, and I'm reading from verses 20 to 22, if you want to read along with me in your Bibles. For he said there that in, in uh, thanking God for showing him the dream, 
he says, Blessed be the name of the God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his, and he changes the times and seasons. Now note this. What's it say next? It says he removes kings and what? Sets up kings. He reveals the deep and secret things. So who is it that removes kings? And who is it that sets up kings? We might think, oh, well, it's the people. <laughs> the people do. <laughs> no, but the people are, are only permitted to do that if God permits it. You see, it's God that does it. He overrules in the affairs of men. And this is the, the lesson that he wanted to teach Nebuchadnezzar. And it was he that controlled world affairs. So, God, so Daniel appears before the king to relate to him the king's uh, dream and its interpretation. And the king says to Daniel, Are you able to make me known unto are you able to make known unto me the dream which I've seen and the interpretation of it? And Daniel responded and said to him, with these words, the secret thing which the king has demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. That's, just, that's uh, number one. None of these people can show it to you. But, Nebuchadnezzar, there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to you, King Nebuchadnezzar, what shall be in the latter days. So that's another clue for us from this uh, prophecy that it relates to the latter days and that we're talking about our days. We are living in the latter days, the last days. And we should realize there's a God in heaven that reveals these secrets and that sets up kings and removes kings. And he has shown to Nebuchadnezzar just what is going to come to pass in uh, these times. So notice what it says here. Let's have a look. Daniel, first off, relates the dream to him. He said, Behold, king, O king, you beheld and you saw a, a great image, a great image, a great statue. And this great statue had a head, and its head was of fine gold. His breasts and his arms were of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Daniel chapter 2, verse 32 and 33. And in verse 34, Daniel goes on to say, that king you saw till a stone was cut out without hands, and that stone came and it smote the image upon his feet. Now that's significant. I want you to note that, that the image is smitten upon the feet that were of iron and break them to pieces, Daniel went on to say. And then, then he explains, the iron and the clay and the brass and the gold were broken to pieces together and they became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. So what happened to this image? What happened to it? It was destroyed, destroyed by a stone that was cut without hands. And where was it destroyed? Where, where did that destruction commence? It commenced where? At the feet of toes, the feet and toes of iron and clay. And then came, uh, and then that uh, stone uh, smashed the image up and it grounded it up into powder. It became like the chaff of the threshing floors in summer, which when the wind comes, it just blows all that chaff away. And the stone, then what happens? So just keep that in mind, that this image is blown away and then the stone becomes, Daniel went on to say in verse 35 of chapter 2, the stone became a great mountain that filled the whole earth. That's, a, that's another key point I want you to, to focus on this evening. That that mountain fills the whole earth. So what does this mean? What does this mean? And what does it mean for us today? Well, Daniel went on to explain. You see, when it comes to Bible prophecy, these are not just written for the sake of writing them. They're not just given to us for the sake of giving them to us. They're given for a reason. They're given to help us appreciate that there is a God in heaven who does rule in the kingdom of men and who cares about us, and who holds the, 
uh, the future in his hands. He knows the end from the beginning and he knows what's going to happen and he knows what we can do to ensure that we will be uh, able to stand amidst all that is about to happen in this world today, that we can stand in with peace and freedom and assurance, trusting in him. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. That's what uh, the Apostle Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. You for prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You see, who is it that gives men their, these prophecies? Who is it that gives uh, when it comes to the Bible, who is it that gives them, the, those uh, biblical authors, the prophecies? As it says here, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This is not like a Nostradamus or someone like that that's just writing different thoughts down that you've got to sort of see if that's going to fit or does it fit and who could that be talking about or who, who couldn't it be talking about? No, no. In the prophecies contained in God's Word we should be left with no doubt that it is God that has revealed those things. And he has not only revealed what's going to happen in the future, but he's given an interpretation of it as well. And let's have a look. What's the interpretation of this, these things? Well, firstly, let's take a look at the first part. In Daniel chapter 2 and verse 38, Daniel explains the vision. He says to Nebuchadnezzar, You are this head of gold. Now, what does that mean? Who was Nebuchadnezzar? Who was Nebuchadnezzar? I've already said it tonight. He was the what? The king of Babylon. But it wasn't just Nebuchadnezzar as the king of Babylon that this head represented, but rather his kingdom. And why do I say that? Because Daniel went on to say in the very next verse that uh, after you shall arise another kingdom. So we know it's referring to a kingdom, not just the king. And when you look at the kingdom of Babylon, I mean, history records that that was a, 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 a golden uh, a city. It was a city of gold. It was the golden metropol metropolis of a golden age. It was the most glorious of the ancient world, the Babylonian city um, that was, uh, that was uh, built by Nebuchadnezzar. He is that head of gold. And one of the key uh, uh, wonders of the world at that time was the hanging gardens of Babylon. I mean, if you uh, look at some of your history books, for those who are interested, uh, some of the things that stand out there are these gardens that were watered all year round. They had so um, architect, or, the, or rather, so engineered the uh, waterway system to keep these gardens watered. And they were known as the hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the wonders of the world. Such a glorious city it was. It was a golden city, um, you know, the world, uh, sorry, history records uh, the wealth of Babylon at that time surpassed all other nations in the known world. Now, Nebuchadnezzar uh, ruled over this uh, uh, kingdom. He commenced his rule in 605 BC. Okay, the date's not so important to us, but just to give you, for those who are interested, 605 BC, when he commenced uh, his reign, and he ruled to 539 BC. Now, you see, in Nebuchadnezzar's mind was, oh, well, I'm going to be ruler of the world. But what God was saying to him, no, you're not Nebuchadnezzar, you're not going to be ruler of the world, because after you, Daniel went on to say in verse 39, after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to you. Another kingdom. And did that happen? Now note, Nebuchadnezzar came to reign in 605 BC, so Daniel, Daniel is uh, writing these things at that time. In 539 BC, what happened? Another kingdom came to power. A second kingdom, Daniel said, a kingdom of, of uh, silver, whose breast and arms would be of silver. And what was that kingdom? Well, for those who know uh, from your history, the next power of the ancient world that conquered Babylon was Medo-Persia. Now, Medo-Persia was a nation of two kingdoms, 
Rather, we're an empire of two kingdoms, the kingdom of the Medes and the kingdom of the Persians, and together they formed one united kingdom. And the Bible says in uh, Isaiah, Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them, Babylon. And this is written in uh, Isaiah 13, verse 17 to 20, just to clarify that it was the Medes who were stirred up against Babylon. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited. This is what God's word declared about this kingdom of Babylon. And just to show just how true this is, I mean, if you were to go today to the ancient ruins of Babylon, it's still there, not inhabited, for over 2,000 years. If you want to prove God's word wrong, all you have to do is go there and rebuild that uh, city and inhabit it. But the Bible says it shall never be inhabited. And this was brought about, this destruction of Babylon was brought about by the Medio Persian Empire, 539 BC. And in history, uh, a notable figure of that empire was Cyrus the Great. And, uh, you know, in, in recent days, um, you know, Hollywood has made much of, uh, of some of these uh, uh, ancient kingdoms. Uh, there was a movie came out a few years ago called 300, a movie about uh, the battle of the Spartans against the Persians. You know, so that's what we're talking about. That's the powers, uh, uh, all, the, all the time frames we're talking about here. But today, you know, Babylon is in ruins. And uh, you can't even get, the, the Bible said, you, couldn't even, you won't even be able to get the uh, Arab to pitch his tent there overnight. He won't do that. That's what the Bible said. And he won't. The city of Babylon, just to give you an idea just how glorious this city was, it was uh, 60 miles in circumference, its outer walls were 300 foot high and 90 foot thick. And what was significant about that was that not only were the walls so, uh, uh, very um, well engineered, but the city itself was surrounded by a moat. So if you wanted to con conquer this city of Babylon, you'd first have to deal with this uh, moat that was around it. And then you'd have to deal with these great walls that were 300 foot high and 90 foot thick. How were you going to get in? You see, it was a complete fortress. But God's word had declared that the Babylonian kingdom would fall. How did it fall? With such a strong fortress, how did it fall? Well, history tells us that in one night, you see, the Persian army had surrounded Babylon, they had laid siege to Babylon, but the Babylonians were so uh, complacent, so content uh, in the uh, security of their city that they didn't worry too much. But outside that city was Cyrus the Great, who was trying to work out how he could conquer this city. And what he decided to do was to divert the river. You see, that moat was formed from the river Euphrates. And so what uh, Cyrus did was he dammed up that river, diverted it around the city, so his soldiers were able then to walk underneath the walls of the city. But then they had another problem. Once they walked underneath the walls along the, along the riverbed, inside the city there was a wall either side of the riverbed. How were they going to get in? Well, those uh, walls had two gates that... Uh, stop people from entering from the riverbed and those gates were shut every night but God's word declared many many years before in fact about uh, 200 so years before in Isaiah thus saith the Lord I want to read to you what God's word declared about those gates God said here regarding Cyrus that, that um, he will subdue nations, but I have anointed him to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will break in pieces the gates of brass. And that's exactly what happened. That night, for some unknown reason, the gates of um, Babylon inside that city, those internal gates, were left open. And Cyrus's army was able to walk, walk in, and the rest is history, as they say. So Medo-Persia was that second kingdom. 539 BC, I want to share a couple of statements from history. Funk and Wagnall's book, page uh, 175, Funk and Wagnall's book 3, I should say, page 175, 
In 539 BC, the Babylonians were defeated by the Persian king Cyrus the Great. Now, the prophecy went on to say <clears throat> that uh, another kingdom would come after that, a third kingdom, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Daniel 2, verse 39, this third kingdom. Now, what happened? Who was this third kingdom? Well, history tells us that, it, that Persia did in fact fall to another power. But who was that power? Let's have a look in the Bible. It gives us an answer here. I want to come to Daniel chapter 8 and verses 3 and 4 because this is another prophecy, but it outlines who the power would be that would come against uh, the Persians. Daniel talks about here a ram and a he-goat. He saw this ram which had two horns and this ram pushed westward, northward, southward so that no beast might stand before him and he became great. Now who is this ram? The ram which you saw having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia, Daniel was told in verse 20 of chapter 8. Okay, so the ram is Media Persia, identifying with the breasts of, of uh, silver of Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. But who was the power that conquered Persia? Well, this prophecy in chapter 8 outlined it for us. It says here, I was considering, and behold, a he-goat came from the west upon the face of the whole earth, and he came to the ram that had two horns. And he came close to the ram, and he was moved with collar against him, and he smote the ram. So this he-goat smites the ram. Who's the he-goat? Well, chapter 8 and verse uh, 21 tells us that that he-goat is the king of Grecia. And it, history confirms that as well, that the king of Greece, led by its first notable king, who... And uh, you, some of you may uh, know this name in history, Alexander the Great. We've had a, in recent years, we've had a couple of movies about him. Alexander the Great, king of Macedonia, conqueror of the Persian kingdom, as Funkel Wagnall's uh, volume 1, page 368, introduces him. So this third kingdom of Greece conquered Persia in 331 BC, history tells us. So... Despite the fact that Nebuchadnezzar wanting his kingdom to last forever, God's word had declared, no, it won't last forever. There will be another kingdom after you, inferior to you, and a third kingdom of brass. And just to illustrate, uh, as silver is inferior to gold, so Persia was inferior to Babylon in its glory, but not in its strength, not in its strength, but in its glory it was. And just as... Uh, uh, brass is, inf is inferior to silver, so Greece was inferior to Persia in its glory, but not in its strength. Then, then what was to come next? Well, the prophecy said that there will be a fourth kingdom. And that kingdom shall be strong as iron, Daniel said. He explained, for as much as iron breaks in pieces and subdues all things, and as iron that breaks all these things shall it break in pieces and bruise. Who was the kingdom that came onto this scene that conquered Greece and that broke in pieces like iron does and bruises? Who was that kingdom? History records that fourth kingdom was uh, the Roman Empire. Both Macedonia and Greece were ultimately conquered by the Rome during the second century BC. And you can consult your history books for that. So the prophecy had said four universal kingdoms would exist, and four universal kingdoms since the time of Daniel have existed Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, and Rome. Rome conquered Greece in uh, 168 BC. Rome had almost become the mightiest state in the east, first by conquering Hannibal's ally Philip V, king of Macedonia. Next came the liberation of Greece, from Funkel Wagnall's volume 22, page 383. So that Roman Empire from 168 BC until 476 AD. But then what would happen? So we'll, so we'll cover now from 605 BC down to 476 AD, a period of about a thousand years or so. But then what would happen? Would Rome continue forever? No, 
the prophecy introduced the feet to us as part of iron and part of clay. And Daniel explained, whereas you saw the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. So the Roman Empire would be divided. But note, not just one medal would follow, but a divided state. There would be uh, the strength of iron and the, str and the weakness of clay in what would to follow. For as much as you saw the iron mixed with miry clay, Rome shall be divided. And what does history tell us? Well, history, in fact, records that Rome did divide. Not one universal empire resulted out of the ruins of the Roman Empire. During the last 80 years, I'm reading again here from history, but during the last 80 years of the Western Roman Empire, the provinces were visited by internal war, by barbarian invasion. The last Western Roman Emperor, Romulus Augustulus, was overthrown by the mercenary Herulian leader Odiasa. These were the barbarian kingdoms, the barbarian nations. And uh, we should have some interest with this today because you and I are the result of that. History tells us that Rome was divided by internal wars and external invasions by barbarian tribes. And the result of those wars and invasions was the birth of, mod of modern Europe. A new beginning was now possible from one uh, history uh, book called The Age of Faith, page 43, which was published in 1950. A new beginning was now possible. The empire in the West faded, but the states of modern Europe were born out of the ruins of the Roman Empire came, in effect, roughly ten tribes. We have the Anglo-Saxons. you remember uh, from history who the Anglo-Saxons are, particularly if you're from England or from Australia, of course, England today. The Franks, you might be familiar with that uh, tribe by the sound of its name. Franks represents who? The Franks represent who? France. That's correct. Alemanni, Germany, the Lombards, the Ostrogoths, the Huroli, the Burgundians, the Visigoths, the Suevi, and the Vandals. And these are Suevi was uh, Portugal, Visigoths, Spain, Burgundians took in the area of Switzerland, the Alemanni, a bit later became Germany. Ostrogoths took in northern Italy and overcame the Huroli and took in the rest of Italy and the Lombards as well. In fact, even in Italy today, some of the uh, names carry over there where you have a little a, a, um, region of uh, Italy called Lombardy uh, that inherited its name from that tribe. So Rome was uh, divided into these ten tribes which went on to become ten kingdoms or ten nations or ten nation-states of Europe. And that took part, took place, or the, the uh, last of those kingdoms came into being in 476 AD, and which marks the final downfall of the Roman Empire. So Western Europe was representing those toes uh, and uh, feet of iron and clay. Now, the question I want to ask is, what was to follow? And that's the question we want to be concerned about tonight because uh, the world, particularly in Europe there, they're all about European unity. They're wanting to bring about a universal one-world government, beginning there with Europe. You've got to begin with Europe to unite all those uh, nation-states once more into one uh, political entity and in turn to unite them all under one banner, one global banner with America, or in the battle for this is America in the leading the capitalist West. You've got the socialists with their agenda, and you've got that third player, the Vatican. Now, will, would they ever succeed? Will they succeed? What does the prophecy say? Well, let's have a look. In 605 BC, you had the head of gold. In 539 BC, we come to the breasts and arms of silver. In 331 BC, we come to the brass, uh, a thighs and belly of brass. And in 168 BC, we come to the legs of iron. And then what? 476 AD, Europe. What follows? Well, Europe, we're coming now, now to the uh, feet and toes of iron and clay. 
The prophecy said that the next thing to happen would be a stone. And that stone would come and smash this image. Smash it where? At the feet. Not at the head, not at the breast, not at the thighs or the belly or the legs, but at the feet. As Daniel said, the stone, he explained this, that the stone which you saw, now note the significance of this. I want you to note this. The stone which you saw was cut without hands. Okay, so there's no uh, uh, human intervention in this uh, stone. It was cut without hands, which smote the image upon its feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Who is this stone? Who is the stone? I want to give an answer to who the stone is from God's Word. In 1 Peter 2, 3 and 4, Peter writes here regarding the sto a stone. He says, the, If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. The Word of God equates the stone or the living stone to Jesus Christ. Again, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4. It says here that the stone or the rock, when referring to Israel when they're there in the wilderness, the apostle Paul is writing here and he's saying that Israel drank of that same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. So the stone or the rock is Christ. So what Daniel's prophecy is really telling us is that the next kingdom, the next world empire to follow would not be one made with hands that is not of human devising. The next kingdom to rule this earth will be the kingdom of God, ushered in by the second coming of Jesus Christ to this world. And he is the rock. The second coming of Jesus represent, is represented by the rock that comes and smites the image at the feet. And what are those feet? What are those feet? Who are the feet? Who are the feet? Can you help me? Who's the feet? The feet are Europe. So that stone in the days of modern Europe that stone will come and smite the kingdoms of this world and break them to pieces, and they shall be no more. But the prophecy said that Europe would try to unite. In verse 43 of Daniel chapter 2, Daniel explained to Nebuchadnezzar that where you saw the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Now what does that mean? to mingle yourself with the seed of men. Well, when we talk about uh, that expression, it's a euphemism for uh, marriage and intermarriage. That they would uh, marry, the kings and queens of Europe would intermarry uh, and uh, try to unite themselves together. And uh, history has shown that, that that's what exactly happened. Through the, since the fall of the Roman Empire, the kings and queens of Europe under one king or queen or another king or queen have tried to uh, conquer Europe and if they couldn't conquer, they've tried to unite it together in, in, uh, in uh, alliances and they've done so, one of the most uh, significant ways or one of the primary ways of doing so was uh, through marrying the princes or, or princes of, um, the princesses or princes of other kingdoms. France and England, Spain and England, Spain and France, uh, Italy and, and, and England, you know, it, it, it goes on. So, and this was going on for centuries. But did it ever achieve universal peace throughout Europe? Europe is just a history of war after war after war. Some of those wars carried on for hundreds of years. And why is that? Well, God's word had declared, if we come back to Daniel 2 verse 43, it says that they would try to mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another. Even though they would marry and have children and thus be related by blood, they would not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. With clay. And that's the reality. 
You only have to go back. I mean, there's so many people have tried it. Louis XIV tried it. Charlemagne tried it. Napoleon tried it. Um, even uh, Kaiser Wilhelm tried it in World War I. In fact, uh, the Kaiser was shown this prophecy. He was shown Daniel 2. And, he, and it was explained to him, look, there's no way that you can achieve a universal, or rather a united Europe. You're going to fail. God's word has declared it would not be united. And do you know what Kaiser William's response was? I refuse to believe it. And what was the result? Sadly, one of the greatest uh, human sufferings of all time in the, in the millions of lives that were lost uh, in that war. Uh, millions suffered in that war, World War I. The, um, as a result of one man refusing to believe the truth of God's Word. I, I also recall a, an evangelist had declared in 1940 that Hitler would not win World War II. And why is that? Because God's Word had declared Europe would not be united. And what did Hitler want to do? He wanted to unite Europe under a th the Third Reich, you know, a, third, a German kingdom with him as the head. No, I'm sorry, the prophecy says they would not be united. Even though they would try to cleave together, they would not stay together. But in the days of these kings, what is going to happen? The prophecy said, in the days of these kings, let's look at verse 44 of the prophecy, in the days of these kings. So who we're talking about? The days of which kings? Or kingdoms? The days of the kingdoms of Europe. We're talking about the feet and toes of iron and clay. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Yes, there will be one world government, but a government made not with hands, not of human devising. It will be God's government, God's kingdom. He will set up and destroy all other kingdoms before it. And this kingdom shall never be destroyed. And it's not going to, to be left to other people. That says to us that it will stand forever. And it will break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. Friends, we are living on the verge of tremendous events. Yes, the turmoil in the world around us brings uh, uncertainty and fear and stress to many people. But from God's Word, we can take courage. We can take courage that, that uh, God's Word is true. It has been fulfilled. God's Word said that there would be, since the time of Daniel, there would be, uh, from Babylon, there would be four universal kingdoms. There were only four. That the fourth one would be divided and remain divided. And it has remained divided. There has never been another universal kingdom until the day that the stone comes. And that stone represents Jesus Christ. And he is coming in the days of these kings. And, that, and those days are now. The days of the kingdoms of Europe are now. And in these days, he will come to establish his kingdom, the final kingdom, and that kingdom will be established on this earth and last forever. We're living in those days when we can expect Jesus Christ to return. We are living in the days when the rock, Jesus Christ, will return to establish his kingdom. But you know, Jesus spoke of himself as a rock. In Matthew 21, when he was speaking to the um, Pharisees and Sadducees, who were the religious leaders of the day, he spoke to them, and in alluding to uh, himself being the stone or being the rock, he said to them, whoever would fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Friends, Jesus Christ is about to come. We are living, where do you think we're living today? We're not just on the feet you know, we are on the toes, on the very toenails. You know, Jesus is coming back. And he says to us, he wants us to realize that whoever falls on this stone shall be broken. 
but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. What does that mean for you and me? It means that if we will fall on the stone Jesus Christ, if we will give our life to him, let our life of sin, our life of suffering, our life of pain, our life of guilt, our life of shame, if we can let that life break up on the rock, Jesus, surrender all to him, then we will be found ready and waiting for him. And his promise is that we will be received into his kingdom and live with him forever. But he says, on whoever the rock falls, it will grind him to powder. Those kingdoms of the image aren't just some immaterial thing. Those kingdoms are constituted by people. And today, we are constituting the feet and toes of iron and clay. When Jesus returns, it will be one great universal destruction. All those who, upon whom that stone falls will be ground to powder. My appeal for you today is to fall on the rock Jesus. While we have time, we have hope. We can give our life to him today. And it's my prayer that, that we will do that, to realise that Jesus has a place prepared for you and I. He promises that to us. He said it to, to his disciples before he left this uh, uh, planet. He said to his disciples, In my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. In John 14, 1 to 3. I want you to be there with Jesus. I want us all to be there with Jesus. It's my prayer that we will be there. That there's not fear for the future. God's got the future in his hands. He sets up the kings. He removes the kings. He will establish his kingdom and that kingdom will stand forever. And we need to be ready for that day. I pray that you and I will be ready for that day. So let's close with a prayer, shall we? Our dear Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be here uh, this, this evening to hear these things. And for those listening at home, for the privilege uh, of hearing them as well. I pray, Lord, for everyone that we might take these things to heart, to realise that you do have uh, things in control. Despite, despite the turmoil we see around us in the political world, in the economic world, in the religious world and in the uh, natural world, you have everything under control, Father. All has unfolded as you, your word has declared and all will unfold as your word has declared. And I pray that each one of us here may be prepared and ready uh, for Jesus, for when he comes to take us home to heaven, that we may be together there with him in that kingdom and so be with thee forever. So may we uh, take these things to heart and uh, may we be ready and waiting for him in that day is my wish and prayer for us. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed watching this video presentation of Daniel chapter 2 and how it relates to world events today. We can be rest assured that God's word is true and that uh, despite the movements that are at play today uh, in world events to bring about this new world order, we know that uh, God's word has declared it will not be, but uh, movements are at play today that will come close to bringing it about, closer than they've ever come before. There are great and momentous events. I mean, this conflict between these three great uh, powers, the capitalist West, the socialists, and the, the global socialists, the global uh, capitalists, and the Vatican, uh, is uh, outlined further in uh, Bible prophecy. Daniel chapter 2 is a framework uh, that every other prophecy in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation fits within. If you'd like to find out more about those prophecies and how they relate to us today, please write to me at the, on the address at the end of the DVD. Also, you could go to the website, which will also, uh, the address on the end of this DVD is there for you. And uh, just contact us and uh, ask for further information and we can send out a catalogue of material available or a free book uh, entitled The Great Controversy, if you'd like to find out more about those events. 
So thank you for watching. I hope you have enjoyed it. And uh, until we meet again, take care. God bless and bye for now.